Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm always excited to talk about my research and uh, hopefully this will be a, a bit of inspiration of how you can put some of your theory and methods the last two weeks into practice. Uh, I lead a project called Hashtag Lovese SDG in Norwegian. Uh, you can say Love C SDG. I'm going to explain a little bit about this acronym that we use. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at Dorothy Donkel. Uh, but I look forward to receiving some of your questions at the end. Um, so be thinking of that uh, as we go through the, uh, uh, the presentation. So this, uh, let's see. This project that I'm going to present is definitely what I would call a transdisciplinary project. And uh, it's really important uh, philosophically that you understand a bit of the underlying philosophy of the project, that the global goals cannot be achieved without the local anchoring. This is something that we believe is, is really important. And so we design our methods and our approach uh, based on this philosophy. But when we talk about localization, uh, we have to define what is the local? Who are the people? What are the laws? What are the regulations? What are the politics of the area? What are the values, the cultural heritage um, of, for example, a cultural environment, a social ecological system? So we need to define that. And then we have a transdisciplinary toolbox that we use to put these different methodologies into a social ecological framework that we can work with the locals to understand complexity. Now, this um, uh, more of the guiding frameworks uh, we use in this project are what we call RRI, which stands for Responsible Research Innovation and uh, Post-Normal Science. These are two uh, really exciting concepts and frameworks that um, I base a lot of, or most of my research on. I'm not going to go into all the details there, but uh, we use that to understand this local case. So, when we talk about interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, these are kind of buzzwords that it's really important uh, to ask people, what do you mean by interdisciplinary and what do you mean by trans? So I'm going to kind of explain that. I come from the natural sciences. My background is in, in fisheries and aquaculture and fisheries management. And when we talk about interdisciplinarity, we can talk about uh, biochemistry. So biology and chemistry coming together. And that, of course, that is an interdisciplinary field, you can say. Uh, but it's a big difference working within the same faculty, for example, natural uh, science faculty, versus doing what we call radical interdisciplinarity, and that is bringing in the social science uh, law, uh, the humanities, with natural science, with medicine, um, with art. And then when we do this radical interdisciplinary uh, teamwork, we develop, it's really important from a project perspective that we have a common philosophy, that we want to make our knowledge actionable. And then according to post-normal science, one of the main concepts there is the extended peer community. So bringing in people from different fields, from different knowledge bases with different types of expertise, also tacit knowledge, to do the transdisciplinary work. So I'm going to show you with my body, more or less, uh, the difference between inter and trans. So interdisciplinary, we can be in the university. We could be working with the different faculties, but we're still in the same institution. For example, the University of Bergen. And this is really uh, exciting work, but it's, it's in academia. And for me, my definition of the trans part is when we actually go out of the university into society, into the case, into the local area. Because then we bring in other people from our extended peer community and get different types of knowledge also. Uh, tacit knowledge in these in these aspects. So that for me, that's the difference. We can't do transdisciplinarity when we're still stuck in the ivory tower in the university. We need to go into the field and make our knowledge actionable. So this is an example of my uh, interdisciplinary, radical, radically interdisciplinary team that we have um, in the Lovese Estegay project. We have four faculties. Hopefully, we can bring in the faculty of art, music, and design uh, later in later on in the project. That's an ambition, personal ambition of mine. Uh, but you see, we have natural sciences, law, social sciences, and humanities in the project team. So I'm going to go through a bit of a, a narrative, a storytelling of uh, how we made our, or we are making our knowledge actionable in the field. 
um, by going through these, uh, these boxes on the right, defining the case region, extending the peer community, refining the case, bringing back uh, impressions into the interdisciplinary lab and then back into iterations with the transdisciplinary lab and synthesizing all this. And this is all to answer the main research question that we have. Uh, and this is how can cultural heritage and cultural environment be used and managed in an integrated and sustainable way. So in this project, you see the, all the different partners beyond the four faculties that we have at UIB. We have international par partners, Vaknian, um, and uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, and CSIRO in Australia, Tasmania, as well as our local partners uh, in Norway. We have the Institute of Marine Research here in Bergen, uh, Norlands Forschning, the, the Norland Research Institute, and the Nansen Center for Environmental Remote Sensing. So now I'm going to get into my uh, pictures, which I think are really uh, quite cool. But let's talk about the region. So we have to identify the region. Lovesea stands for Lofoten, Vesterolen, and Senja. This is the northern archipelago uh, area of the Norlon uh, Regional County. And fishing has been going on here for over a thousand years. So there's very much of a cultural heritage and the cultural heritage is intertwined in the cultural environment. So the people are using the environment to form their heritage. And it's uh, really a mecca for artists and for tourists. In my opinion, it's the most beautiful part of Norway. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to go, uh, it's really amazing. Here's some footage that I took uh, when we were there this January. And so most of the pictures I'm going to show you uh, in the rest of the presentation is from this January study trip that we did. But before we went into the field, we got our interdisciplinary team, our radically interdisciplinary team together. Uh, here you'll probably recognize a very eminent scholar, <laughs> uh, Hova, who is in our advisory committee, uh, scientific advisor for the project. Uh, we need to define the case region and we, we do this and we get together our team and a bit of team building exercises. And then we go into the field to refine this and extend the peer community. This is Brita, Brita Stoll. She has a headlamp on because it's January. There's only about four hours of daylight in the north at this point with her dog Nansen. And she is under some of these iconic structures called Yella, where they dry the codfish and make uh, stockfish in Lofoten. Brita works with the SDGs in SALT, SALT AS, which is a research and consulting company. Uh, had different locations, but their main location in Svolvar in, in Lofoten, in our case area. She works with these people. This is her study area, and she works with the SDG. So this was a really great opportunity for us to get on her home turf, get her ideas of how can we localize, because the region is big, there's lots of stakeholders, and we needed to get much more narrowed down. So also as a part of this uh, teamwork, we invited uh, Celia Vesslen, who is from the Norlon County um, administration. And she was also with us to try to define which stakeholders would be receptive to this collaboration, which ones should we maybe avoid, which, which aspects of the stakeholder relationship do they think is something that uh, we could build on. So extending the peer community made us really focus in on the potential to make Ande uh, Comuna, so this is the island of Andea, which is uh, this red region up here. This is a really fascinating island um, that, where there's a lot of different activities, everything from whale tourism, uh, puffin uh, bird watching, to uh, rocket launching. I'll show you a little bit of that. And the, this was a, a perfect case for us, it turned out. Uh, but we didn't know that until we went there. So we get in our rental car, we rented a, a hybrid car and drove three and a half hours north from Svolvad to the tip, the northern tip of Andaya, which is the capital called Andanes. And there we were able to meet with uh, uh, the one spatial planner that exists on the island, uh, Emil Iversen, uh, because we want to get an idea of what are his issues that he has with localizing the SDGs. What type of reporting is he required to do and is he doing that reporting and how is he uh, doing that reporting? Where are the knowledge gaps uh, in the spatial plans and the uh, uh, in connection to the SDGs? 
So this, uh, he was very receptive and also took us to the uh, Andaya uh, Space Center, which is a, it's a space center and they launch rocket ships. It's one of the best kept secrets in Norway. It's been there since 1962, so really quite integrated part of the island society. And um, showed us how they do this. Uh, this is, it was really quite interesting. Uh, but of course, when you're in the field, it's also a bit of ethnography going on, absorbing the impressions, collecting lots of different types of data. One of the ways to collect data is through uh, pictures and reading the local newspapers and getting an idea of what is it that people are talking about, what type of values do they have. And we get this um, data and impressions from the field so you see a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new type of inspirations that are in the local field and refining the case with the locals getting back into the spatial planner's office looking at maps uh, talking about what are his national requirements and how is he meeting those and where could he get some help where does he need help from academia also refining the case with the locals as far as the space center is concerned uh, this is some of the trajectories. They launch rockets into space for research and for satellites. And uh, how are they localizing SDG target 14.1, reduce marine pollution, when the rockets always end up at the bottom of the ocean after they come back into the atmosphere? So that's uh, an issue that they haven't had to think about before the SDGs came, and now this becomes um, an, an, an interesting issue that we can work with them to discuss. Also, refining the case with the uh, locals, we are developing a digital tool and working with small businesses. Uh, the ARC tool, which I'll, I'll show you a couple um, ideas about uh, later, uh, is really Im important in working further with SALT and one of their different locations in, in Rombag uh, to get, again, this kind of personal professional opinions about how we are approaching things and what we should do and who we should contact. Then we got, after this uh, research trip to uh, Lofoten Vesterholm, we got on the train from Narvik to Stockholm. Uh, I don't know how many hours we spent on that train, overnight train, like 15 hours or so. Uh, going to the Stockholm Resilience Center and working on the social network analysis and the, the methodology here with Örjan Bodin, who is one of the great uh, social network analysis experts. And this is really interesting because we can use social network analysis to basically map the human uh, landscape here and put them into groups, understand networks, because the maps give you the descriptive, how people are connected today. But also maps are a launching point for the normative. How should people be connected? How should businesses or investors or citizens be connected? So this is a really um, helpful um, method for us. And then back into our interdisciplinary lab, back to the uh, University of Bergen and with our partners to not only bring in uh, coastal ecology and, and these aspects of SDG 14, but also law, social science, linguistics. Um, one of our advisors is Chesty Flutum, um, who really helps us understand the power of language in the discourse. In our transdisciplinary lab, we include uh, industry, startups, citizens, uh, but also small business. And uh, the, we've been working with Karen Berenson, who's the CEO of ART. And she's developed uh, over the past years ART dialogue tool for scoring the UN global goals. And here you see um, us in this workshop setting. And uh, in the bottom here, you see the island and how we can place different icons and ask citizens specific questions about how the SDG and different targets relate to that area. So we're using this as a dialogue tool, but also as uh, we're trying to develop it as a reporting tool as well. This could be used at the business level, but also perhaps at the municipality level. So this iteration with this transdisciplinary lab. Right now, my PhD, actually right now, <laughs> uh, Jessica Fuller, who is my PhD student on the project, she's in the field uh, putting a focus on the dialogue with the fishermen. Uh, so this is really exciting. Uh, and not just the fishermen, but also the other projects that are going on on the island. There's Spaceport. They're building a brand new rocket launching um, site to launch rockets for Amazon and Google. So getting more of the Wi-Fi connections up into space. That's a huge coastal project. But another project that's uh, going is this uh, land-based salmon farm that will be, um, uh, let's see, on the east side of the island. 
And this, the idea is that this salmon farm will also be using wind energy uh, as their main energy source. This is very exciting, but you see how it will impact the coastal area. Uh, you'll see how it will bring jobs to the area. This is all things that we are mapping and having this continuous dialogue. Okay, so I'm at the uh, ending part of the presentation. Um, where I wanted to talk a little bit about these misconceptions or falsehoods or concerns that people have with the term transdisciplinary research. Usually it's because they, they're not used to it, they're used to being very disciplined. Um, but I want to put this out there and maybe it will spark even more discussions. First of all, some people think that uh, that we shouldn't be doing the planner's job. Why are you working with them? They have their own job to do. We have our job to do. Why are you trying to do the planner's job for them? And, and this is a, a very important discussion to be had because it's also about the role of academia and the role of, um, of local administration. So the planner is required to localize the SDGs, but how to prioritize and identify the synergies and the complexities <coughs> in these synergies uh, to support the goals. We think that academia can bring in new perspectives and develop methods that can be used. So very much a methodological development, um, you know, hand in hand with the users. Um, a lot of people think that, okay, well you work with small businesses, you work with businesses and industries, you're losing your objectivity. Uh, we find this um, a very big falsehood. <laughs> Partly, this is a bit philosophical, but when was science ever objective? We are humans. Uh, we see the world through our eyes. We see the world through our methods. We don't have an objective um, um, uh, way to get the, the methods. So we, we really believe, and this is getting back into the extending the peer community and post-normal science and responsible research and innovation, that we build these connections and relationships with other knowledge holders, and that gives us a new dimension of quality. And then finally, the, the one that probably relates most to you students is that, uh, uh, okay, well, we're going to have non-experts in these jack-of-all-trades. Uh, the students need to be disciplined. And I totally agree with that. Single disciplines are absolutely essential for us to understand uh, how to get the goals, but you don't just take sustainability science off a shelf. Sustainability science doesn't belong in one discipline. So what we want to do is you have to have your expertise, uh, but we also want to train that respect and the knowledge of how disciplines can come together. And the, the just kind of like the, the human aspect of collaborative research is really important. So when practicing RRI, Responsible Research Innovation, we always try to walk the walk. Um, I've been really inspired by uh, the Center for Energy and uh, Climate and Energy Transformation and the climate policy. UIB is going to be climate neutral in 2030, so we always try to walk the walk or take the train, <laughs> in other words. Um, this is an important part of the ethics of our research. Here's a, a subsample of our int radically interdisciplinary team, and thank you very much. Stop the share. Great. <laughs> thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Howard. So for those of you who came uh, late uh, into the broadcast, um, uh, Dorothy Dankel is a researcher at the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Bergen. Um, and uh, she leads a project that looks at S SDGs uh, through the lens of local communities. And that's what she's been talking about um, today. So, so that was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate this, this move uh, that you talked about from uh, interdisciplinarity into transdisciplinarity and how that involves a, a, sort of a human dimension. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, no, I noted that um, you, you don't just take sustainability science off the shelf, yeah. which was a, I think a great a, quote, I think. I think it's a quote that I picked up from Silvio Fontowitz, who's one mm. of the founders of post-normal science. Uh, but yeah. I think that it, it gives a, an ex, a concrete example of what we're talking about. Mm. Great, so you're going to get uh, two interventions or comments, uh, maybe challenges from, uh, from students at the Bergen Summer Research School. Um, and first we have Anand Singh Bhopal, who I hope uh, is with us. Can we bring him in? 
huge thanks, uh, Dorothy, for your um, for your presentation today. Um, really, so much uh, thought provoking and interesting ideas to dwell on. And in fact, it really reflects a conversation we were having in my department, which is the Department of Global Health and Primary Care. I work in a priority settings group on, on health. Um, my background's in medicine. And um, we, we often uh, have to think about much broader questions to do with society and how you should develop priorities and also systems and ways of thinking. So I was really interested in your, in your distinctions that you made between interdisciplinarity and, and transdisciplinarity. And I think that is, a, is, is one that's not often enough teased out. Like, how do you actually uh, intervene in the societies and involve the societies that you're, that you're studying and interested in? So it got me thinking about this idea of education. I think that was really one of these thought-provoking points that I, as I said, was uh, trained in medicine. So there is a re real focus on technical expertise. Um, and of course, everyone recognized that's important. But it's remarkable change that's taking place at the moment, which is that actually these other facets of understanding the public health system, understanding aspects of advocacy and how you truly represent patients is an issue that's been rising further and further up the agenda. Now, it takes quite a long time to that, for that to be reflected in university curricula. And I'd be quite interested to know how you feel that could be reflected in curricula, both the, at the undergraduate and uh, postgraduate level. Um, regarding uh, just a couple further questions, just picking up on what you said. Um, regarding the, oh, you should be able to see me now. Uh, yeah. uh, hi. Um, so just a couple of further questions. So regarding this, uh, this issue of, of uh, sort of training and focus and really specializing in something, um, how, how do you think that can be delivered? It strikes me that we, we, we really are trying to juggle two quite different things. And there's often um, a real balance to be made and a, a real compelling argument that has to be made to the people that teach us and the systems in which universities are gained, which are so focused on expertise. Finally, just regarding, I mentioned that we work a lot on priority setting in health. And often that requires balancing out things that are very, very different so, for example, you might get health gains, but you might have impacts on the local environment and all these different factors. Now, this is an extremely challenging thing for us to be balancing out. And often people, in some sense, say, I appreciate all of these societal environmental factors, but we're just going to focus on health as purely defined by the presence or absence of disease. And that's generally how the global burden of disease and disease control priority measures are, are, are done. Um, and you mentioned about salmon farm, online salmon farm, and it mentioned about trying to balance up some different priorities there, including jobs, the local environment, and, and so forth. How do you think about these different priorities and how do you think we should be balancing those up? So thanks again for your presentation. I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, thanks, Anand. Um, should we... Yeah, I think there were some specific questions there, so if you want to address those before yeah, we're answering. Yeah, they're, they're extremely thought-provoking, so I will... Um, I think I'll, the best way for me to uh, discuss these big topics, um, I, I think from the educational, the, the, the undergrad and graduate question, I think that came in first. So how do you, the way I understood it, how do you um, do that type of education in an institutional setting? And this also gets back to this part about being disciplined uh, is be very important. Um, and you, we can't, uh, teaching transdisciplinarity, um, um, it's kind of, uh, um, you, have to, you have to kind of show it. Because there's the theory, but you have to kind of get people into the field. And I think that that really should happen at a later stage. Uh, my personal background is that I had, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Biology and French, and I went to a liberal arts college, uh, Hillsdale College in the Midwest in the US. I'm, I'm originally American. Um, and that gave me um, 
a very broad view. And I did it because my parents and grandparents told me I knew I wanted to be a marine biologist. I knew that since I was six. Uh, but they were scared that if I specialized too early, I would be closing a lot of doors. And they thought that maybe I would have to be working as a volunteer at an aquarium the rest of my life. So I did a general background in biology, and I, I had to escape the Midwest. I had to go to Europe, and so I ended up in France for a year and got a double major. But that gave me an appreciation of the breadth of, um, of topics and subjects like history and religion and philosophy that I was able to get back to in my graduate work. So I, I really believe in the liberal arts education and specializing later on because I think a lot of the transdisciplinarity is that respect for other, pe other people's discipline views, different cultures in science and education. I think one of the big uh, challenges we have at institutions, take UIB as an example, is that we have, um, most of our professors aren't doing transdisciplinary work, right? There's just a kind of a small subset of us that are actually doing it, so how can we expect them to teach it? But I think that uh, at the graduate level, getting into research projects, and, and having summer school that is showing how you could put this all together and into a kind of a academic sandbox really helps the graduate uh, student and then also <clears throat> from a career standpoint because I want to train uh, graduate students that are able to go out into the workforce and make do with what they have. They can be creative. They know how to work with people. They can go into local government or national government and res have that respect for the other disciplines. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, um. I think that's that's really interesting. And, and previous in this uh, this course, we've we've talked about uh, this kind of uh, going out of the the, sort of the, the disciplinary uh, box as something that that is has been um, sort of a threat to people's careers. But now you're kind of talking about it as as giving a new opportunities. I I I I generally think genuinely think that um, if we stick with it for another little period, this will be much more the norm. And it, it's creating skills that are absolutely needed for the future. Um, so I, my career has gone different places where I really had the end goal in sight all the time. I want to do research that's used. And I want to work in the field to get to get shit done. <laughs> uh, so it is a bit normative in that sense. The SDGs are a normative framework. Yeah. We're trying to develop the world in a sustainable fashion, inclusive, and leave no one behind. How the heck are we going to do that? So we're trying to do, use that normative um, push to put together inter and transdisciplinary mm -hmm. groups. That's great, and we can get back to that. But we also want to hear from Estra Elmitani, uh, who's the second student who will. Uh, uh, provide some uh, commentary or provocations. Um, Esra, are you with us? Yeah, uh, I'm here if, if you can hear me. Um, so thank you, uh, Dorothy, for, for this really uh, nice presentation. Uh, as Howard just says, it brings uh, along some of the discussions that we have been having uh, through the summer school. Uh, about uh, the interdisciplinary uh, actions and also about the impact of the work that we do as researchers uh, on the ground uh, and what um, whether uh, it should be uh, an isolated uh, island uh, that focuses on research and our uh, uh, separate topics or should we venture to go in more into uh, the society and see uh, what really is happening uh, out there. So, um, I come from a little bit of a different uh, background. I come from an engineering background, chemical engineering to be uh, specific. So uh, my undergraduate studies were all about um, the industrial sector and uh, such complex engineering uh, ideas. Uh, but um, after graduation, uh, I started to think that, no, I want to do something that has more of an impact on the ground. So I went into uh, the environmental sciences first and from there into the sustainability uh, point of view. Uh, and what I've seen on the ground really that uh, most of the time um, the NGOs and uh, the private companies, the people who are uh, working on the ground and uh, they're in very close relation to the communities often have uh, much, uh, much more felt impact 
than whatever policies and uh, um, uh, other uh, things that are uh, being put uh, in an umbrella to cover uh, the whole uh, country. Um, in, in my view, there, um, in the solid waste management problem in Egypt, they have been a very um, active player in solving this problem and also coming up with innovative solutions for recycling and for social inclusion for the people uh, who work in, in, in these areas. So it is really nice to see this example that is also uh, occurring in your uh, uh, research, although it's in another focus. Um, however, I wanted to ask you uh, maybe a couple of questions. Um, first of all, um, the, the conflict between uh, the focus of a PhD researcher uh, who should be focusing on a certain point and the work that is being done on the ground in a transdisciplinary uh, measure that should take into consideration uh, all the other disciplines as well. So uh, some people find that this can be a little bit uh, conflicting. Uh, also, uh, you mentioned that you are working in your project with other um, uh, private sector uh, companies. Uh, and I wanted to uh, ask you about your insight about uh, the dealing with, with these private sector uh, companies uh, and what are the pros and cons that they bring to the table in such a project uh, that's done on a bigger scale uh, than they normally work. So thank you again for your presentation. It was really, really nice. And uh, I'm looking forward to more discussion. Great, thank you, uh, Astra. Astra is sitting in Cairo, and uh, it's nice to be able to, to connect in, in, in this way. There was yeah. also some specific questions there for you that you yeah. might want to address. But before you do that, I just want to say to all of you listening, um, there's a chance for you to interact as well. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A, uh, or you raise your hand. We might try to actually uh, uh, connect, dial in some of you from wherever you are, um, if the technology is, is with us. So either Q&A or, or raise your hand. Tori. Thank you, Ezra, for those thought-provoking comments. Um, so I think I distilled two specific questions that I, I could uh, address. I think the first one was about um, in the PhD education and research, how do you separate that from the overall, the big transdisciplinary project? Mm -hmm. And this has been a very much a learning experience for me. Um, because uh, Jessica Fuller is my first PhD student, so we really had to kind of work this out and had a really good dialogue between the two of us um, of the needs of the PhD students because they have to get a PhD in something hmm. and uh, versus the needs of the project itself, who, trying to do this uh, TD transdisciplinary work. And uh, that has been a really constructive dialogue that has also changed my thinking too because I, I can't use the PhD to, um, to get all the connections for me that I need uh, to get my stakeholder workshops going and stuff like that because that's more or less, it's, a, it's borderline administrative work, but it's part of the research too, at least in my mind. Um, so we've, we've um, really made a very strong um, division of work in that she, and this is the University of Bergen who is also forcing us through this, or not forcing because it's the way it should be, <laughs> um, the process of developing the PhD description and the plan. And uh, so she has her own plan and own um, work packages, if you will, that are totally separate from the project. They are related, and the project can draw on some of that research. But uh, when she's in the field, um, she's addressing those questions that are specific research questions for her specific PhD in sustainable coastal ecology. So um, that, this, is, uh, this is an important thing, and it gets to the relationship with the supervisor. Um, and, and, that, and that's a process, so I, that's been uh, helpful. I think that's a really important point that we, as more as people who have finished their PhDs and perhaps in a more established position, mm. don't sort of push the PhD students ahead of us and say, you yeah. go out and do the <laughs> transdisciplinary stuff. Right. Because right? I also often see that happens in, 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 uh, in projects. It, it does. It, it, and it's a, a bit of a blurred line, too. So, and then getting to the question about um, private businesses and private companies and that collaboration, yeah. uh, because at the, it, it's a um, one very essential thing, I can't believe I haven't even said it yet, but essential thing in radical interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinary work is within your extended peer community getting a common language. It takes 
so much time and you have to massage the dialogue sometimes and always ask those quote unquote dumb questions. What do you mean by success? What do you mean by bottom line? What do you mean by profit margin? Because if you, if I'm working with a private company, they need to make money. Otherwise they have no job. I don't need to make money in the same way. We have a totally different culture in, in academia, but we both know th that to mm. begin with, right? Yeah. We have different objectives. Um, but at the end of the day, I can't work with businesses who don't share the same philosophy as me, right? So working with Karen Berenson and, and Art, um, has been a, a real boost uh, for us because it gives us the tangible tools that we need that I need coders and I need the graphic designers to do that because that's not what I do. Um, but they need us to ask the right questions, to get the right people around the table, to be able to get out the information that we need so that we can look at this in a collaborative way. And then the spatial planner can use that to think about spatial plans and with more complexity. So, um, but to, to put it, uh, to make it as simple as possible, um, working with private companies is also working with people and you have to create that common language and then an underlying philosophy. Yeah. And this links up to a question that's in the, in the Q&A right now. Um, so how do you make, which is about the synergy, how do you make the synergy between politicians and environmentalists who sometimes have uh, different mindsets, different, different uh, yeah. concepts? And is, is that a role for academics, or is that your role, you think, when you're out in the field? Yeah, somewhat. I, I think this is where it's just been a huge boost for my career, um, the advent of the SDGs, because this makes that collaborative process so much more straightforward, because we have global goals that have been approved by all the UN countries that give us that signpost. This is the direction we want to go. And that makes it just so much easier at getting back to the term anchoring. Anchoring that um, before, before the SDGs came and, and became so, so normalized at UIB, um, I don't think people really understood what I was trying to do. <laughs> or maybe I didn't even understand what I was trying to do. But after the SDGs came, it was just so much easier to make connections and say, yeah, we're working and localizing the SDGs. Oh, if that's what you're doing. Um, yeah. then we get the point. So you get over that first threshold and then it's much easier to work with politicians because they need to report on this. Yeah, yeah. So it becomes actionable. Yeah, and they also know what the SDGs are. They and, know what and, it is, and... but sometimes they don't. So, yeah. um, but then it's easy to point them in the right yeah. direction. The first, the first point of, or the first action of localization is awareness yeah. of the SDGs. So. Um, but okay, getting back to Esther's question about the difference than this actionable politicians versus the PhD, um, we, Jessica and I have had this discussion also with the other uh, supervisors that she has, at, um, Ingrid van Putten at CSIRO and Marlous Kran, a marine uh, social scientist in the Netherlands, that we don't we want to get their values and their and their 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 opinions about sustainability without telling them what that is. Right? We, can't, we don't want to show them the SDGs, where are you on this, in her PhD research. Because then you're not getting, you, you're, well, it's a leading question and you're framing the question. Yeah. Um, but in the workshops, when we were trying to report and develop methods for SDGs, I can't really work with those people if they don't understand what the SDGs are, what they're trying to do. So that's, a, that's yeah. very much um, a dichotomy there. <laughs> I want to try to uh, take advantage of uh, that technology allows, uh, and we have two raised hands, uh, and I'll try uh, Muhammad uh, Asad Usman, you raised your hand a, a little while ago, but hopefully you're still with us. I'll uh, allow you to talk now, and if you would uh, concisely uh, phrase your question or comment, you're still with us, Muhammad? Okay, thank you. Do you hear me? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Uh, so I am Dr. Asad from University of Oslo. I am doing my PhD in global health and antibiotic resistance. So it's definitely a multidisciplinary approach. And I am working in this field for last 10 years, uh, like with microbiologists. I'm a medical doctor, but I work with microbiologists, qualitative researchers, uh, as well as uh, the a statistician and many multidisciplinary geography geographer like for GIS locations these things. So the problem uh, 
I think uh, the multidisciplinary is definitely a good approach. And I am, I also did my master's in One Health from Mass University. Definitely is a good job. But what I feel when I work with the uh, local community, like uh, this is the problem of, I think all over the world that the researchers are very much uh, happy to publish their research work and work there uh, to show this, uh, their research to the globe. But the problem is the local community are not too much aware of the outcome of the result. And like you were working in the Lofoten Island and the local people are engaged in it. But my question is how these people are aware of the scientific background, why you are doing the objective of the study and what will be good for them after this research. And the same thing I feel for my research also. I now I am currently working in Ethiopia. And for this season, when I felt it in Bangladesh, where I worked before, uh, I always try to disseminate uh, my research fundings and my objectives through some local gathering, not in a so much uh, formal way, but uh, I, I try to gather the local people and the study of subjects after my research. And I delivered some outcome in the local language to them. And the same thing, it is very much difficult, I feel, when it is multidisciplinary is engaged. Like, I can express my research findings, but not give the, Dorothy. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, I'd like to give Dorothy an opportunity to to, to respond. Okay. To that. Thank you very much. Yeah, the thank question. you, Mohammed. So the question being that in a multidisciplinary setting and working with locals, um, how much of the it, that it's really difficult to mm. educate. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, it is. I uh, thank you for sharing that you're actually trying to do this work because I think we have to realize uh, how important it really is. Um, I I tend to um, rely on a lot of analytical thinking, and uh, sometimes I think, why is the situation what it is today? Why is it that a lot of the local people they need some more multi inter transdisciplinary knowledge, but they don't have it. Why did we, how did we get that way? And uh, who is responsible? Um, I think it gets to the, the larger issue of bottom up versus top down forces. So bottom up, you know, being in the field, trying to educate people and, and all that, that is extremely important. But I think we also need to be knocking on some doors or maybe rattling something or other, um, making a bit of noise to the top down effects. So is it because uh, these people didn't have access to education? Is it because our existing institutions are so siloed and they don't respect the need for the crosstalk in the integration of these? Because I, I do think that sometimes we're really working, um, what do you say, against the stream that inter and trans is so important, but um, we're still getting students that don't respect that or don't have any um, any experience with that hands-on from, from uh, we, yeah, they might get it from a kindergarten level and maybe at elementary school, but even some high schools and, and undergrad degrees are so disciplined that then, yeah, we have to get those that changed. We need the discipline, but we need that respect. And then I think that learning in the field becomes just so much easier. Yeah. Thanks. I would like to try again and bring in uh, another person from outside. David, uh, you raised your hand a while ago. Are you still with us? Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, my name is David Sekamate from Martha. Uganda. Yes. Answer. Are you able to hear me? Right. Are you able to hear? Me? Okay. Great. So um, I, I, I'm 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 from education background. And, and, and my research is around climate change education and sustainability education at universities. Um, the topic, the, the presentation that you made was really very, very useful, but I have uh, two questions and one of them relates to what my colleague uh, from Ethiopia just raised. I, I'm wondering, um, because sustainable or sustainable development goals quite often will remain on paper or remain academic, in universities, um, if if it's if it's not translated into local practices, and therefore my my question is, how can universities or researchers engage communities and the private sector, for example, in coming up with small 
uh, local kind of sustainability practices arising from these big um, you know, goals that we have. Because the university has all the information, they are researchers, and they, they, there is quite a lot, but th there is a disconnect between the university and the local communities, especially at local level. So how do we ensure that universities can be able to engage communities um, based on the research and the information they have to be able to come up with some sustainability practices? The other question, which is related to the colleague who has just asked, how do we ensure that research findings on sustainability um, is disseminated to non-academic audiences? Because quite often we researchers do a lot of research we come up with interesting findings, but we end up writing them in journals and maybe books. And many of the communities and private sector don't read this because they're not part of the academic environment. So how do we ensure that our research is really disseminated to non-academic audiences or fora so that the local communities can be able to be able to understand what's happening? Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, um, great questions. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, so let's get to the dissemination aspects. Um, there are so many ways to both communicate and disseminate, get the, get the message out there. It's a bit connected to also the question about um, private um, uh, awareness or, or businesses or, or local governments and that type of thing in academics. Um, and it also is related to Ezra's question about um, the connection with the PhD. Uh, the PhD, to get a PhD here in uh, Norway, you have to publish three papers, basically, and those have to be in peer-reviewed academic journals. So then, from a project perspective, we know that we're getting those, but we also need to disseminate out to the policymakers, the local people. And I think the best way to, one of the best ways to do that is to have them in the publication as the collaborator <laughs> so that's what they make them a co-author and then they're gonna <laughs> spread it and then it gives a bit of prestige um but also of course finding the right journals i mean i am an academic so i need to publish and i really believe in the peer review process um so i can identify journals for example we have a journal marine policy uh, is a journal that is really read by a lot of policy uh, members so that's, that helps. Um, but also when you're making these connections, um, I mean, I have some of our partners, they're on our Microsoft Teams um, group or team on Teams. Um, so they see the little links to papers that I put out there. So they're, they're part of the process. But then I love Twitter because um, I, we can reach a totally different audience and in um, different ways to, to show them the links. Um, I also love working with uh, my new partner in crime is uh, Lindley Christofferson, a, a great graphic designer here located in Bergen, and I'm bringing her into the research to help graphically describe uh, a better graphical communication of what's going on, because then you'll reach different audiences. Um, so being the part of the creative process, and that's why I have this ambition to get the, the faculty of art, music, and design into our, our project specifically. Um, so then the... Uh, the, the, in, so Bergen is another a good example of uh, the Bergen, um, what's it, Nattingsrod um, in English? Chamber of Commerce. Chamber, the Bergen Chamber of Commerce has really a, been a big adapter of SDG thinking and a, at least the awareness <coughs> of that the SDGs exist. So the Bergen Chamber of Commerce, I think it's two years in a row that the SDG walk up flew in. Yep. So they have these beautiful... It's very beautiful. <laughs> These cubes, the SDG cubes, one of uh, 17 cubes for the, all of the SDGs, and they put them up our, our beautiful walk up the Mount Fleuren uh, for a night wandering. So they're lit up, and at each station, uh, people who are experts uh, or working with that specific SDG get to talk to people. Um, we took our three kids on this walk, and they get a little bit curious, right? And it becomes a communication uh, event uh, to be a bit creative. And then there was a big concert uh, afterwards. And that, uh, that's an example of academia meeting um, private society and, mm. and, the, and the, the Bergen Chamber of Commerce, all the local businesses. Mm. There's a question in the chat, uh, early on in the chat, from uh, Alicia that I thought would be interesting to bring in now. Um, so is there a danger that trans transdisciplinarity has become this kind of a new, new sexy, sexy way of doing research? Mm. Uh, and I, I guess, uh, as she pointed in the question, the danger of that would be that we kind of label it as something and we get credit for 
for being so fantastically transdisciplinary. Yeah. Uh, maybe at the expense of actual transdisciplinarity and actual bringing on board of, of stakeholders. Is, yeah, that, is that a danger? There's, there's always a risk that things get so sexy that they lose their meaning, right? So um, when I listen to presentations and people talk about interdisciplinary research and just transdisciplinary, my immediate follow-up question is, what do you mean by transdisciplinary research? What are you doing? Like, tell me, what are you doing? Who do you work with? What are the processes? Because then it'll be very clear if that person has reflected on the depth mm. of their knowledge or their depth of their um, yeah potential for that type of research. And it's always the t the term transdisciplinary, in, in as I mentioned, interdisciplinary is there are so many accepted definitions. It's not just one thing. So I always try to explain what I mean. So this uh, aspect of radical interdisciplinary is really important to me. And when I talk about trans that leaving the university, I just try to communicate that um, to to show the purpose. Yeah. So it'll be very clear if people are talking about cross and multi and inter and trans and throwing these sexy words in the air, if you ask the follow-up question, you know, what is your background? What are your methods? How do you include people? How do you work out conflicts with, with different methodologies or different terminologies? Um, and that will give, I think, more of a respect to the term. Yeah. And then there's another question that points to um, the uh, the discomfort of this this transdisciplinary work, and what that brings up for me is, uh, you are we uh, doing transdisciplinary work are engaging with lots of different um, groups and types of people mm. with lots of different expectations of us, mm. uh, lots of different understandings of what the different concepts mean, mm. lots of different interests, mm. uh, and again lots of different expectations to what our research can can do, mm. and I guess that. Uh, at least that I have uh, been in situations where that creates uh, discomfort in a way or it creates sort of an uncertainty of whether or not we're talking about the same thing. Mm. Um, is that something that you've uh, yeah. experienced? There, uh, so my main life philosophy, I guess I have lots of life philosophies, but one of them is um, controlling expectations and managing expectations because I think that's the number one way to prevent conflict. Um, just again, getting back to my my personal narrative of I have six ongoing projects like all of us do we have lots of projects we're dependent on project work um, to stay in business to say and there's a lot of expectation all of these six have their own stakeholders their own networks their own expectations of how I should be working right and so being able to manage that um, is something that is a dialogue and it's it's so much people management right that's what what humans do. I mean, we work with each other. We we have to manage expectations. But but people skills and getting back to the term of uh, creating a common language and what are the expectations for mm. my work and for your work? Just basic project management is managing people. Um, it's I'm I'm happy that I only have one PhD student now because <laughs> I don't have to divide too much of my time. But if I had more PhD students, you know, you want to create the expectations that. You know these synergy effects that they can help each other. Um, they're not always dependent on one-on-one -on -one discussions. Of course, there's a, a weekly one-on-one -on -one discussion, but the, that they can use these synergies. Um, so there's, you have to manage expectations, but you can't do that unless you el elucidate these expectations in a dialogue. Um, I think the biggest challenge is the stakeholders uh, expect you to communicate with them continually. Yeah. And that's very difficult. <laughs> so finding ways of, um, you know, monthly meetings, bi-monthly meetings, ways to get people together that are kind of stuck in the calendar so that you show your face and you communicate and that they feel that they can call you when they need to. Um, yeah, these communication pathways, defining those is really important. Yeah. We're almost out of time, but I want to bring, uh, come back to a point that we've already talked about a little bit, but, but I think it's, it's really important, so I want to end on that. And that is... Um, how you, how you, you talk about this transdisciplinary as, as a kind of a, a boost to your career or something that, that creates really um, useful tools to engage with the world. Whereas I think uh, some of the other discussions we've had during this time has been, or at least some of the comments from, from many of the students have, that they've felt that this, has, this new or new or this different way of working um, uh, kind of breaks with the kind of mold that they're expected to fit into and therefore it can be detrimental to their career. Mm. At least that, that's, that's, that's a fear mm. that, that many have. 
Yeah. Could you, uh, I, it's, if it's, you could end on that, on that yeah, note? Yeah, it's uh, super legitimate. Briefly. It's very legitimate. And I, I'm, I'm just so thankful that uh, I had these notions of intern transdisciplinarity um, before we had SDG Bergen and that the SDGs came to the University of Bergen in a way and that we had the SDG conference and we have a rector who says yeah. SDGs are important. And it was, I, I was prepared. <laughs> so I was maybe... It, we, we're so blessed to have that at the University of Bergen. It makes our life easier, and we totally recognize that this is unique. There's not. This isn't n normal. Yeah. <laughs> so I would um, really um, encourage students to make contact at the institutions where this is more normalized, and also show colleagues, show them SDG Bergen, show yeah. them our SDG conference, show how we're we have day zero events and we're trying to do this actionable knowledge. Because this will spur, um, I think, it could spur a lot of positive um, effects in other places. But we have to really take care of those colleagues who, I mean, we still have colleagues here at UIB who don't know what the SDGs are. I mean, that's, that's just the fact of the matter. That's, that always happens. But um, respect colleagues that don't, uh, don't know what the SDGs are, don't understand what inter and trans uh, means. Because uh, that's to that's also the state of affairs. That's the majority of the people, and being helpful and um, nurturing with those dialogues. Um, but I think what always help help helps me to explain these type of things to people who don't um, aren't into type of systems thinking or or SDG type of thinking is just bring it back down to the story, the narrative, mm -hmm. the person, the planner who needs new knowledge to, to f work with complexities. Br just bring it back to the local because then you see how this can help. Yeah, bring it back to the local. Great, that's a great place to, place to start and that's something we've talked a lot about uh, mm -hmm. uh, at this Bergen Summer Research School. So thank you very much, Dorothy. This has been really inspirational you, and I think all the students have felt the same, at least uh, it's, it seems like that from the comments. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I will. That come in, I can um, answer these. Type answer yeah, these yeah. Uh, later. Sure. So look for those. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Now, if we were physically together, we would break out into big applause. This would be a smaller <laughs> one. But <laughs> thanks for the questions. <laughs> um, so we're going to ease into a, a closing ceremony now. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring on stage um, Anneline Eriksen. Uh, and and bent the moon, and we need another chair for that. So if we would like to sit here. And we get a signal when we are ready to go. Anneline Eriksen is uh, vice rector for global relations at the University of Bergen, also professor in social anthropology. And bent the moon uh, is professor of global health, right, and director of the Center for International Health. Uh, and the Global Challenges uh, area at the University of Bergen. So, um, welcome to the, the closing ceremony um, for uh, Bergen Summer Research School uh, 2020. So here we are, we did it. Um, we were, uh, when we realized that we had to do this virtually and couldn't bring everyone to, uh, to Bergen, we were uh, first a bit afraid, I think. And uh, kind of struck by uh, by this by this challenge, daunting challenge. Or how do we do this? Is it possible? Um, and uh, we we did have discussions of uh, whether or not we should uh, we should cancel. I'm very happy we did not. Uh, and I think that uh, the this uh, th these past two weeks have, have shown that uh, it is possible, and that there are also new opportunities that come with this with this. Um, this, uh, this virtual platform. We've had a, a record number of participants. We've had 130 people, uh, or students, uh, mm -hmm. part, as part of the Bergen Summer Research School. Of course, it's easier to, to participate, and it lowers the bar for, for participation when, you can, when all you need is a laptop and an internet connection, uh, as opposed to having to, to fly to, to, uh, to Bergen and get a visa and all of these things. Of course, uh, we loved to have all of you uh, here in Bergen. Uh, and we really missed uh, this, uh, this, uh, um, yeah, this, the mingling and, and all the social occasions that that, that would have uh, enabled us to have. But also, um, we should really appreciate that, that the, the, the the opportunities and the possibilities that these uh, virtual platforms have have um, have, um, have have given us. 
So um, the theme for, for this year has been actionable knowledge uh, for global uh, challenges. And we have talked about um, a lot about what we had just addressed in this seminar with, with Dorothy. And so how do we, not just how do we, the, we create, produce good knowledge, rigorous science, but also how do we interrelate with, with society? How do we engage with stakeholders? How do we bring that knowledge into society? Uh, how do we make knowledge shape society, as is the, the motto of the University of, uh, uh, of Bergen. And we have uh, addressed this uh, through uh, five specific courses. Uh, and um, I've heard from the course leaders that uh, things have been going well in, in all the courses. Uh, and and uh, the virtual platform has, ha ha has worked well. So I would like to, to, uh, to thank the course leaders for the, uh, the, uh, the, the flexibility that they've shown and taking on this, this challenge of, of turning uh, Bergen Summer Research School into, into a virtual, um, virtual summer school this year because of the pandemic. Um, so um, uh, I would like to thank uh, Peter Andersen and Ragnil Overo for their course uh, on, on food and global food systems. Um, I would like to thank uh, Siddharth Sareen, who helped me out in our course on, on cities in climate and energy transformations. I would like to thank um, Holvar Mo and uh, Jan Fredrik Hovden for their course uh, on media and democracy. Uh, C.A. Gloppen and Daniel Rachel for their course on, on global, global climate governance. And Esperanza Diaz for her course uh, on, on health and migration. So we've had we're going to do an evaluation of how Bergenson Research School has, has worked and how the courses have worked, but so, but so far I've had really, really good, uh, good feedback. So, that's, so that's, uh, that, that's very promising. So then I would like to give the word to um, Anneline Eriksson, again the Vice, Re Vice Rector at the University of Bergen for some closing words. Thank you so much. Dear participants, organizers, scientific leadership, congratulations. <coughs> I am deeply impressed by how the summer school has managed to perform during really challenging circumstances. At the at the as the universities here and around the world shut down their physical activities in early March, the summer school took the bold decision to organize the first ever digital version of the Bergen Summer Research School. And I am so pleased that they did this. And I'm sure you are all, all the participants are equally pleased. The annual Bergen Summer Research School is an interdisciplinary venue explore, exploring some of the greatest challenges of our time. This year, as Hova just said, 133 students, a record number from six continents have participated in five courses during the last about two weeks, I think. Um, although actual physical interaction and learning, where social gatherings, talk over coffee, walking together from one lecture to another, that must have been difficult this year, I suppose. <laughs> I do hope that there has been some sense of global community developing among yourselves and between lectures, lecturers and students, because this is really important to keep that global community. And um, especially in a summer course, a summer school that addresses the global uh, societal challenges. So I am truly proud of the summer school here in Bergen and what the organizers have <coughs> achieved this year. And I want to thank in particular this year's scientific leader, uh, Professor Hova Horsta. He took on a truly great challenge and he, he has shown with effects also for the future that a digital summer school is indeed possible. It does not mean necessarily that all summer schools should be digital, but it does prove that a digital participation is indeed possible and that perhaps in the future, um, a hybrid version will be cater for both campus-based participation as, as well as digital options might be a way to go. I therefore want again to convey my congratulations on the first ever digital uh, summer school. Thank you. It's been really, really fantastic. 
As I'm sure you know, the Bergen Summer School is a joint venture on the lead leadership of the University of Bergen with the Norwegian School of Economics, Economics and Business Administration, and the Christian Mikkelsen Institute of Human on Human Rights and Development, and the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences, and the Research uh, Institute Norse. My great thanks are due to all of those who have contributed and might made this fine event possible, and to all our invited scholars from Norway and abroad, and all the students from around the world. I thank you all for taking part in this event, and I look forward to seeing the results of your work in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shandali. And I also want to thank you for the amazing support from the University of Bergen in, in making, this, uh, making this happen. And I, I totally agree with this importance of global community, and uh, uh, and that's what one of the fears we had is that we well we might be able to to do to convey the information uh, in the courses to the students, but not to be able to make this kind of community feeling. Um, <coughs> but I know that now in many of the courses, the students are self-organizing social events uh, after this. Uh, so hopefully that that uh, that creates some of that global community. So there will be some digital coffee and drinks. Digital coffee and drinks, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Now I will uh, pass the word to, to Bente Moon. Thank you very much, Howard. Uh, you showed really that we can do it. Mm. So uh, I'm uh, very proud on behalf of you. I'm a director of the priority area called Global Challenges at the University of Bergen. And we are responsible for running the summer school every year. And this time it was really special. and. And it needed someone with courage this time to run the, a digital summer school for the first time and in very, very short time period. So I'm uh, really uh, congratulating you. It went very well, Howard. And you did a very good job together with the rest of us. Um, because um, we are more than the people on the stage. Uh, we are a number of people behind the scenes that must be thanked on a day like this. Um, this, we have a secretariat in the Global Challenges, consisting of Havaida, Turd, Tera, Tore, Inge and Ingvild. A very good team. We do a lot of things to um, foster multidisciplinary work and the summer school is one of them. And now, these weeks, we've been only concentrating on the summer school and they've all been very helpful. In addition, we had course assistants, Janne Björgan, Giedre Kasaite, <coughs> Pierina Velando and Edwidge Ekperle. And uh, we also received help from Anja Tucker and Maria Krog. Uh, we must also thank the learning lab at the communication department at our university, Tane Holmhøysetter, Svein Kåre Sture and Eline Skakstad. And uh, also at the end, we must not forget our distance learning expert, Laurie Blair, coming from Scotland to help us. She's not here now, but Without her, I don't think we would have succeeded. It was a very good cooperation with her and the, and the team cooperated so very extremely well, actually. I've never seen anything like it. So thank you all. You've all done a wonderful job. Absolutely, and it's been great to work with you and, and, the, and uh, all the people behind the scenes in, in making this happen. It's been, really, it's been really fun and it's been really a, a learning experience for me as well. So thanks for the opportunity. So now uh, we're always looking towards the future, of course, and uh, now I'd like to bring uh, in uh, Katja Enberg, who is um, Associate Professor at the Department of Biological Sciences, and Katja will lead next year's Bergen Summer Research School. Yes. So what do we have in, what do we have in store for next year, Katja? Well, I'll tell you. First, I, uh, I just uh, share my screen, because I have a small presentation here. Let me see this one and hopefully does it look okay yeah so thank you uh, Håvard and uh, I would just uh, like to first say that I'm really thankful and extremely excited about this opportunity to lead mm -hmm. uh, the Bergen Summer Research Pool uh, in 2021 it's a it's a fantastic opportunity and uh, the course uh, or the school next year has this overarching title of science and society towards the sustainable development goals 
and then the word towards there is this solution air into it. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that we work on solution and not just problems. Yeah. So um, let me see if I now manage. Yes, I managed even to change the slide. Uh, so SDGs. I'm sure everyone listening now is very well aware of what they are. Uh, I particularly like this um, presentation uh, of, of the SDGs, uh, comes from the Stockholm Resilience Centre, that puts them in the categories of biosphere and uh, society and economy, kind of highlighting the three legs that the sustainability on, on standing on. And uh, all this uh, that we'll have next year will have focus on one of the one of the SDGs. So I'll just run quickly through them. Um, so we have first maybe I should turn like this sure. so you can yep, also can see what's also. going on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have a course that is focusing around the SDG three, good health and, and well being. There uh, the course title is Adults and Reproductive Health, Gendered and Global Local Dynamics. We have three uh, course leaders from the University of Bergen. Then we have a course focusing on quality education, and there we have a course that has a title Internationalizing Higher Education. Also with three course leaders from the Western Norway University of Applied uh, Sciences and from UIB. Then uh, we have a course uh, on, uh, focusing around SDG 10, Reduced Inequalities, and it's called Social Economic Inequality and the course leader is coming from the Norwegian School of Economics. And we have climate action, uh, where a course leader from, the, leader from the UIB will be having a course with titles Psychological and Social Science Perspectives on Climate Change. And then we have a course on uh, uh, SDG 14, which is kind of my SDG. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I'm together with a colleague, we are leading a course in sustainable development of life below water. And then we go to Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, where we have a course called Corruption, Research, Regulation and Governance, with a course leader from the Norwegian School of Economics. So there are courses and sort of all all on the all legs of, of the sustainability and I, I was listening to a discussion about interdisciplinarity or trans and all, all those uh, different terms and what I think is really important to keep in mind that we everyone needs their safe space they, they need to have both legs also in their own discipline so that's important to remember when when we are talking about interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary dis, oh, it's difficult but disciplinarity so but we need to work with each other, right? Uh, and that's uh, that's why I've uh, been uh, talking with some colleagues at UIB, and I'm very happy that we've also now will have three uh, three of our colleagues that have been having the course with title PhD for innovation, interdisciplinary course from systems thinking through creative problem solving to research and <laughs> development management. Very long title. Uh, so there, now we will, so we have these six courses that I just uh, uh, presented. And then, as I'm assuming, we'll have a, a regular uh, physical summer school. Uh, so this is the plan now. Of course, it might change in the course of, uh, of next year. We, no one really knows what's going to happen. Uh, but then a lot of the kind of common activities would be working across the different courses in uh, interdisciplinary teams and uh, and uh, uh, across uh, across the different courses working towards solutions on uh, on uh, decided themes so these people that are on the screen now they have methods from the uh, systems thinking and uh, working in uh, creative uh, interdisciplinary teams so I'm really looking forward to pu pulling all the students together and working in uh, in this uh, in these solutions so that's uh, that's it from now um, I'm really hoping all of participants from this year will spread the word tell their colleagues and friends and uh, whoever uh, mm -hmm. that there is a great opportunity in in Bergen and I really hope uh, to see a lot of lot of students uh, next year as well. Great! Thank you very much Katja. This sounds and looks very promising and very exciting. <laughs> I'm sure that lots of students will be interested in, in, in taking part and I also encourage all of you to uh, 
um, either participate or spread the word to, to colleagues and, and, and students about Bergen Summer Research School next year. It will be great, I'm absolutely sure. So with that, uh, there, all that's left is for me to say uh, thank you. Uh, good luck with finishing your coursework, good luck with finishing your, your, your PhDs, and good luck with uh, using your knowledge to change the world. Thank you. <laughs>